This pair of lectures addresses how law enforcement can compel assistance for current surveillance. Put differently, police already have a suspect, and they want to surveil that suspect. Police need some help, though, to carry out the surveillance. They might need to work around some encryption, for instance, or activate some feature on a device. Before turning to substance, I want to make a disclaimer. This area of law is very unsettled. Only a handful of cases have been litigated. I'm going to do my best to make sense of this area of law, but please don't expect too much clarity. All right, so there are four main ways in which law enforcement can compel assistance with current surveillance. First, assistance orders under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Second, provider warrants and subpoenas might be viable as tools for assisting with surveillance. Third, orders under the All Writs Act. That old statute enables law enforcement to compel assistance in executing a warrant. Last, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act allows for orders in conjunction with current surveillance. In the interest of brevity, I've separated the All Writs Act into another lecture. And since CALEA is mostly about future surveillance, where police don't yet have a target, I'm also going to put it on hold for a separate lecture. That leaves us with ECPA assistance orders and provider warrants and subpoenas. So let's get started with ECPA assistance orders. I hope you recall that there are three parts to ECPA. The parts that regulate prospective surveillance, that is, the Wiretap Act and the Pen Register Act, have provisions that expressly authorize compelled assistance. Since the drafting of those provisions is very, very similar, I'm going to lump them together. Okay, so here is the idea. The government can require assistance in conjunction with a wiretap order or a pen trap order. In either case, compelled assistance requires court authorization. A request just from law enforcement isn't enough. Now, who can be compelled to assist? The statutes discuss communications service providers, landlords, custodians, and, quote, other persons, unquote. That sure reads like a very expansive list, especially the open-ended final category. In a 2003 opinion, the Ninth Circuit chimed in. Before returning to the law, let me sketch the facts of that case. The FBI realized that a car's built-in microphone, ordinarily used for a service like OnStar, could function as a roving bug. Agents applied for and received a wiretap order that compelled the car manufacturer to remotely enable the microphone. In the course of its opinion, the panel offered its view of who counts as a, quote, other person, unquote. It held that an other person is anyone who provides some sort of service to the target and is uniquely situated to assist in intercepting communications. That certainly included the car manufacturer, which was involved in providing the OnStar-like service and could remotely enable the microphone. The panel also concluded that the car manufacturer counted as a communications service because even though it had outsourced the system's cellular network, it still was closely linked to the service. So, that's the story on who can be compelled to assist. Again, the ECPA authority is very broad. Now that we've covered who can be compelled to assist, let's cover the logical next question. What sort of assistance can be compelled? Here, the statutory text reads that the government can compel all information, facilities, and technical assistance necessary to accomplish the interception or pen trap installation unobtrusively and with a minimum of interference. That's a mouthful, so let's break it into two parts. The first part asks, just how much assistance can the government demand? The text of the statute sure seems broad, all the assistance that's necessary. Unfortunately, at the time of recording, 
there really isn't any case law on the issue. The only case on point is United States against Lavabit. Let me briefly sketch the facts of that case, and then the legal arguments. Lavabit provided what it dubbed secure email. For the most part, the system actually worked just like ordinary email. A user could log in and save drafts and eventually send mail. A user could also receive email in their inbox and download that mail and save an archived copy. One of the precautions that Lavabit implemented is transport security. It's used by all the major email services, as well as many popular websites. Two particularly common protocols are Transport Layer Security, or TLS, and Secure Sockets Layer, or SSL. The lock icon that sometimes shows up in your web browser uses this very technology. OK, so here's a very rough sketch of transport security. It protected data as it flowed between a user's device and Lavabit servers. Put differently, it established a secure tunnel between the user and Lavabit. Both the user and Lavabit could still read the data, but nobody outside could read the data. Let me repeat that because it's critical to understanding the case. Lavabit could read the data that it exchanged with users. It chose not to. Now, before establishing the secure tunnel to Lavabit, a user wanted to make sure they were actually communicating with Lavabit. That feature of transport security relies on public key cryptography. If you're curious about the nitty-gritty technical details, I highly recommend my colleague Dan Bonet's course on cryptography. For our purposes, the punchline is that Lavabit held a special number, called a private key, that allowed it to authenticate itself. Whoever held that private key could credibly claim to be Lavabit. The same private key was used for every user, so compromising the private key put every user at risk. All right, so that's the type of security that was at issue in the Lavabit litigation. In the world of computer security, a compromised private key is a really big deal. Whoever holds the key can impersonate the service to anyone. You may have heard some of the recent concern surrounding the Heartbleed vulnerability, for instance. Much of that concern was precisely about private key compromise. So that's a quick sketch of transport security. I want to stress that the very same technology at issue in the Lavabit case is used by almost every popular online service websites, apps, email, you name it. You probably used transport security to load this very video. Now, Lavabit did have another, more unusual type of security. After receiving some messaging data, Lavabit would encrypt it such that the user's password was required to decrypt it. That security wasn't much an issue in the litigation, though, so I'm not going to focus on it. If you aren't familiar with the Lavabit case, you might be wondering why this niche email service got embroiled in litigation. The reason is that Lavabit was Edward Snowden's email service. Unsurprisingly, a day after Edward Snowden went public, the Department of Justice served a de-order on Lavabit. That order wasn't an issue in the Fourth Circuit appeal, though. A couple weeks later, the Department of Justice served a pen trap order on Lavabit. That was the focus of the case. As I hope you recall, in the context of email, a pen trap order is sufficient for prospective session and message metadata. So, the DOJ was seeking information about where Snowden was logging in from and the people he was talking to. Ordinarily, when an email service complies with a prospective surveillance order, it doesn't need to compromise its private key. Let me explain how that works. The email service simply makes on-the-fly copies of metadata or content, and then it directs the copies to law enforcement. Put differently, transport security between the user and the email service is entirely unchanged. 
the email service simply establishes an independent conduit to law enforcement. Implementing this approach is usually very straightforward. And at a high level of generality, it's how popular services implement support for prospective surveillance. All right, back to LavaBit. There's some debate about how cooperative the company's founder was. In a charitable interpretation, he just moved slowly and would have eventually complied with the pen trap order. He did have some conversations with FBI agents about how he might comply. In a more critical interpretation, LavaBit's owner was obstructionist and ideologically opposed and had no intent of ever complying. Whichever you believe, this much is certain. The Department of Justice got impatient after a couple weeks, and it demanded LavaBit's private keys so that it could accomplish the pen trap itself. Let me explain how that would have worked. The government wanted to launch a man-in-the-middle, or midum attack against Edward Snowden. The idea was that the FBI would pose as LavaBit, using LavaBit's private keys. Users would think they were connecting to LavaBit, but they were actually connecting to the FBI. Then, the FBI would redirect the traffic to the real LavaBit. The net effect is that the FBI would have access to data that users were sending to and receiving from LavaBit, and users would be none the wiser. The reason technical experts were so concerned about this approach is that it exposed every user's data to the FBI, not just Edward Snowden's. That data included usernames, passwords, and email. What's more, the FBI had to actually snoop on every user. Before a user connected, the agency didn't know whether it was Snowden, so it had to monitor at least the login portion of each user's traffic. Before turning to what the Fourth Circuit held, I want to make two observations about the law that applies to government man-in-the-middle attacks. First, the government is required to filter out other users' data. A wiretap order or a pen register order applies to certain individuals or accounts. As for when that filtering has to happen and how it happens, the law isn't clear. The most likely approach is real-time filtering by the government's surveillance gear. That's what the Department of Justice proposed in the LavaBit case, and it's technically quite feasible. The second observation I want to make is that a man-in-the-middle attack is a fallback procedure. The government cannot immediately demand a private key. That's because, ordinarily, the key isn't, quote, necessary, unquote, for surveillance. As we saw earlier, a much less intrusive approach is technically quite feasible, and almost always what's used. So here's the big legal question under the Wiretap Act and the Pen Register Act. If the ordinary approach to surveillance falls through, can the government then demand a service's private key and conduct a man-in-the-middle attack? The district court said yes, and when LavaBit and its owner failed to comply, the district court judge held them in civil contempt. They appealed the contempt citation, and the Fourth Circuit said pretty much nothing. Remember from the first part of the course how issues of law are usually reviewed de novo? That is, the appellate court makes no deference to the lower court? Well, according to the Fourth Circuit, LavaBit failed to raise its objections to the compelled pen trap assistance in the district court. For much of the district court proceedings, LavaBit's owner represented himself. The legalese for that is appearing pro se. As an aside, going pro se is usually a really bad idea. It's easy to bungle the law, and it can really annoy a judge. All right, so the Fourth Circuit believed that LavaBit had failed to preserve its arguments for appeal. That meant the standard of review was ratcheted way up. It was no longer de novo. One reading of the Fourth Circuit's opinion is that LavaBit totally forfeited its objections to the pen trap order. In that reading, the Fourth Circuit said absolutely nothing about the government's man-in-the-middle approach. In another reading, 
the Fourth Circuit panel applied a very heightened standard of review and essentially held that the FBI's man-in-the-middle approach wasn't flagrantly unlawful. That doesn't tell us whether the approach is unlawful, of course, so it doesn't provide much guidance for future cases. So, to summarize, all that discussion of lava bit gets us to a maybe. If the government does not get timely assistance with a prospective surveillance order, it may be able to demand a private key and launch a man-in-the-middle attack. A district court judge bought the argument, and the Fourth Circuit certainly didn't reject it. If that's the close case, then the government's power to compel assistance is quite substantial. Now let's turn to the, quote, minimum of interference, unquote, language in the Wiretap Act and the Pen Register Act. In the company case, the Ninth Circuit shed a little light on what that language does. Two judges on the panel voted that if surveillance totally disables the system, it can't be compelled. Since what the FBI wanted to do with the OnStar-like service would have disabled it, the court held that assistance was not required. What about the opposite, though? If surveillance doesn't disable a system, then maybe it can be compelled? The majority seemed to suggest that, but it wasn't very clear. One judge wanted to adopt an extra wishy-washy test, that if surveillance assistance is an undue burden, then it can't be compelled. Here, the car manufacturer already had the capability to flip on the car's microphone, so there wasn't an undue burden. So, that's the complete picture, such as it is, on what sort of assistance can be compelled under the Wiretap Act and the Pen Register Act. Since we just covered a lot of ambiguous law, let me recap with an analytical framework for ECPA assistance orders. There are many moving parts and many possible arguments to make. I want to focus on the three issues that practitioners seem to most often emphasize. The first question to ask is, is this a covered person or business? Generally, the answer is yes, because of the broad statutory categories in the Wiretap Act and the Pen Register Act. The other person category is especially broad. A second question is, is this assistance necessary to accomplish the surveillance that the court authorized? If the business offers a much less intrusive alternative, then no. If an online service, for instance, implements a pen trap or wiretap in the usual way, then the government cannot demand the service's private key. If the business doesn't offer a satisfactory alternative, then maybe it can. The third question to ask is, would the surveillance have a minimum of interference? After the company case, if the surveillance would entirely disrupt a system, then probably no. Otherwise, we're once again back at maybe. Let me offer a few hypotheticals about compelled assistance. With a pen trap or wiretap order, could the government require pushing a messaging app update with a backdoor in it? Or if the company doesn't promptly comply, can the government require handing over a private key so the government itself can push an update? The answer to both of these is maybe. The law just isn't clear. The Department of Justice certainly asserts it has these authorities. As an aside, since these require fiddling with the software on a user's device, they're likely a Fourth Amendment search. So a pen trap order would have to be combined with a warrant. Here's another hypothetical. With a pen trap or wiretap order, could the government require falsely authenticating a device so that it receives communications? Let me give a concrete example. Can the FBI require Apple to add an FBI iPhone to your account so that the FBI receives copies of your iMessages? The answer, once again, is maybe. All right, enough about ECPA assistance orders and how ambiguous the government's authority is. Now let's very quickly turn to provider warrants and subpoenas. The idea, simply, is that the government would use a provider warrant or subpoena to compel disclosure 
of a service's private key. That raises two important legal issues. First, does a private key count as evidence or fruit of a crime such that a warrant or subpoena could issue? Put differently, under the relevant statutes and rules, and under the Constitution, is this the sort of information that can be seized or subpoenaed? I'm afraid I don't have an answer for you. A second legal issue is, would the warrant or subpoena function as a backstop for an ECPA assistance order, or would it be an independent source of authority? Once again, I don't have an answer for you. I can offer this much. DOJ tried both a warrant and a subpoena against LavaBit, using them as a backstop to a pen trap assistance order. The district court seemed to buy the arguments, but the Fourth Circuit didn't reach them. In sum, this is an undeveloped area of law. There's been only a little scholarly debate, and almost no case law. So, that's really all there is to say about provider warrants and subpoenas. In the next lecture, we're going to look at the All Writs Act. It allows the government to compel assistance in conjunction with a warrant.